Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Daniel aka Hashlips and in today's video I'm going to be showing you how to make a game using the HTML5 based browser game engine Construct3. I believe the best way to get into coding is to see results. What better way than creating a game without really using any JavaScript code, but at the end we will have a game that we can play. Now Construct3 also allows you to add JavaScript and be all fancy so we can get into the nitty and gritty parts as well. But the purpose of this tutorial is to get you excited about creating games, learning JavaScript, seeing results and having fun in the browser. Now Construct3, there's actually a previous version called Construct2 and I am used to that one. I used it a lot quite back in the day to create some educational games. And I must say it's a pretty fun engine. It runs completely in the browser. So if you go to the top over here, you can simply launch it by clicking on this button. You can then use the trial version, which is free, and you can simply start creating games. How cool is that? So this is how the engine looks. Now, like I mentioned, is that I actually have gone ahead and got myself a subscription. And the reason for that is because you can use way more events and it's a lot more fun when you get to export to different platforms using Skira's um, backend service as well. So I would suggest if you want to get a plan, get an individual plan. If it's only for a month, it's about $11. In no way am I advertising Construct3 on my channel. I just simply love the product. Anyway, to get started, we can go ahead and launch it like we did now. Or you can download it to your computer as well. I'm going to do that and work from the downloaded version. But like I said, this whole engine runs in the browser and it's quite cool. So let's dive in and look at the interface. This is how the dashboard looks when you land on it. You get to create a new file over here, open other ones. Here's a recent section you can see there. I looked at a traffic system and made a sketchy website, which was pretty cool. You can explore around on these tabs, but the most important one that I think if you're new to Construct3 is actually going through these recommended examples. You can click on browse examples over there and then see a whole wide variety of what's possible with this game engine. At this point, I just would like to mention that if you look here at the top, Construct works in these browser tabs. So as you can see, we're currently on the examples browser. Then we can go to the start page again and you can close them if you want to. But going back to the examples, we can see that there are some 3D examples as well as a lot of 2D games. Although there are some nice 3D examples, working with 3D in Construct is very hard because it's still in a basic form. If you want to create a 3D game, it's best to use a game engine like Unity and that involves a little bit more coding, but I can make tutorials on that too. For now, Construct3, I believe, is a great 2D engine and that's why we're going to build a game that is uh, 2D and have some fun. But I highly recommend going through some of these examples and I think in some videos, I will actually explain and go through these examples myself so that we can explore it together. To get started with our game, let's go to the dashboard and click on new. I'm going to give my project a name, call it Sketchy Ape Survival and keep these settings uh, to the default. These settings basically determines how your game is going to be portrayed, talking about the aspect ratio and what kind of sizes your viewport should be. The viewport size is the size that you will see on your screen. You can always change these settings later, so we're just going to say create. Here we go. This is how the whole kind of interface looks of your game engine. The interface might look challenging, but it's really not. All you need to know is that you have your tabs up here with your play button if you want to execute and test out what's happening. You got your tabs, again, the start page, our layout, and an event sheet. An event sheet we'll talk later about when it comes to coding our items. For now, the layout is where you kind of define your game items and place them around in your world. You can see that there is this fine line over here. 
This is actually the viewport render that your game will show. The rest of the world, if you hold spacebar and move around, these are all extra parts if you want to move the screen around. So to simply put it, the viewport is what people will see and the rest is the rest of your world. You can play around with these sizes. I'm holding in control and with the middle mouse um, button, I'm scrolling in and out to zoom. And I can also press the middle mouse button, hold and drag around to move around in my scene. You'll get used to navigating around and that's as simple as it gets. On the left hand side, we have the properties panel. Now this whole panel changes based upon which element you have selected at any given moment. Currently, if we click in the gray area, we're not selecting anything and we can see that this layout is selected. We can change the size of the layout and play around with it. Or if we select this folder over here in the project panel, you can see that this changes and updates. Here we can fill in the form about what our project's about, fill in the details, change colors, displays, as well as the viewport. Remember the viewport is what the user sees. And if we go to the layout, this is the size of the whole layout itself. That's why this gray piece is bigger than the viewport. On the right hand side, we have the project panel. Now the project panel simply keeps track of all your objects and instances of the game. We usually get a top folder, which is one project, our game. If you open it, you'll get a folder which has uh, layouts, only having one currently, you can have many, and event sheets. Usually you get a layout and a pair event sheet. You can link them by clicking on the layout and on the property panel, you can see that this uh, layout is linked to the event sheet number one. And there it is. So later down the line, if your game gets bigger and you have more layouts, you usually put the code with the layout and you pair them. For now, having one layout and one event sheet is perfectly fine. We also get a folder for scripts, object types, which is going to fill up quite uh, quickly as we place in more objects. Then we have families, which is when you group certain objects and want effects to be applied on top of a whole family, some timelines, sounds, music, videos, fonts, and etc. Now, I'm going to go and explain what's happening throughout this uh, process as we go along, but just know that this is where all the files live. Every time you select something, whether it's an object or the project or an instance, the property panel updates, and that's as simple as that. The last panel that's quite important is the layers panel over here. You get layers per layout, so because we're on layout one, here's all the layers. It doesn't help to just have layer one, two, three, four, five to infinity, and it makes sense to organize our project. So for instance, we will start off with a new uh, layer, firstly calling this one BG for background, and then if we want to add a layer on top, we can maybe make this the player. We don't have a player yet, so we're going to insert it now. But let's go ahead and rename this to player. Now we get a background layer as well as a player layer on our layout one. You can also change the layout's name, so let's go ahead and rename it. Seeing that this is going to be the main layout, I'm going to go ahead and call this main. And then also update my event sheet. Now it is good to kind of keep some kind of um, format, but I'm going to just call this main event um, sheet like so, and just make sure that they are still paired. The main layout is linked to the main event sheet. Great. It's good to organize your project as you build it because later on you might get confused on where stuff is. When inserting objects into your game, just make sure you are on the correct layer that you want to insert them on. You can always change where they are placed on which layer, but it helps to just keep track of that from the start. You can also lock layers if you don't want to move elements or simply turn them visible or invisible by ticking this uh, checkbox. Then I didn't show how you create a layer, but you simply right click and you can add a layer to the top or to the bottom. There we go. 
So now let's go ahead and add a player. So make sure that you are on your new players layer. Then there are two ways of adding new game objects in Construct. You can either right click on the layout itself and click on insert new object, or you can click on this object types over here and add an object here as well. Whichever way you choose, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna click on the right click on the layout and click on insert new game object. You will be presented with a screen called create new um, object type. Now each object that you create has a type and there are a lot of types. We're gonna go through all these types uh, soon, but the type we are looking for is called a sprite. Think of a sprite as like a image that you place in the game, but it has much more functionality like adding animation and all these kind of cool things. I'm gonna click on sprite and then just simply insert. Now you'll have this crosshair. This crosshair indicates that you can place the game object and I'm gonna click anywhere and there we go. Construct brings up the animation sprite editor. Now with this editor, you get to add animations to your sprites and all sorts of cool things, adding images, which we'll do on a later stage. For now, I just wanna fill my cube with something. So I'm gonna click on this fill button and maybe make this black square. I'm then gonna go and close the screen and there's my so-called player. It's a little bit big. However, if you wanna get back to the editor screen, you can simply double click on that sprite and edit it. So we only have one frame, it's a black square, and that's how we're gonna leave it for now. You can move it around, and I'm gonna actually uh, reduce the size so I can grab one of these corners, hold shift to keep the size uniform, or you can simply play around with the size over here on the properties panel. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see our player aka the black square, but better. And on the left hand side, you can now see that we've got the object type. Now this is one object type and we're going to rename it. So right click on it and let's call it our um, player. And that's it. Now we're gonna have one player, but I just wanna illustrate that what I told you before is if you select an object, the properties change. These are the properties of our instance, well, our player object type. You can go ahead and change the properties here and we will be adding behaviors soon. At this point, we can probably play the game and see how it looks. I'm gonna click on this play button over here at the top and there we go, it loads and there is our player. By the way, when we export this game, this will actually show up in the browser or depending on which platform we export the game to. But this game is really not fun at this stage. There's a black square on the screen and that's about it. We can't even move it around. That's where behaviors come in. So let's close this and talk about behaviors. So each object that you, you know, insert into your game and how you do that is by right clicking insert. Each object has a behavior that can be attached to it. Behaviors are exactly what they sound like. It's how the object behaves. So if you click on edit behaviors over there, or you can right click on your player's object and then edit behaviors over here as well. There are always these two ways of doing it. I personally like selecting the object and then editing the behavior here. So I'm gonna click on edit behavior and then click on add new behavior. There are a lot of behaviors to choose from and it all depends on what game object we are busy with. So for instance, we can add a drag and drop behavior, click on add, and we've add this behavior. You can also add more than one behavior to an object. On the properties panel, under the behaviors tab, you can now see there's a drag and drop and you can also set the settings over here. For instance, enabling and disabling this behavior. With the drag and drop on our player, we can close this panel and click on play again. This time you will see that we can now drag around this black square. How cool is that? And that was pretty easy. We can close this again and for a player, we don't really want to drag and drop the player around unless that's the game you want to make, but we want to have it move around with our arrow keys. 
So click on edit behaviors again. I'm going to right click and delete this behavior and instead add a new behavior. This time we're going to add the eight direction behavior. Click on add and then close it. When we click on play now, we hopefully can use the arrow keys to move around our player. And indeed, you can see we can turn the player around and there we go. But now what happens if we exit the screen? We're just going to go off screen. What if we want the player when we exit the screen to pop up on the other side, basically wrapping it? Well, let's go back to our game and then let's select the layout. We can see that this is the size of our whole layout. But remember, if we select this um, game, we can see that the viewport size is only this big. I'm going to copy this size and then go to my layout and simply replace it over here. Basically, I want the layout to be exactly the same size as my viewport. So now it nicely fits snug in there. The next thing I need to do is add a wrap behavior to my player. So again, select your player, click on edit behaviors and add a wrap. Select the wrap behavior and click on add. Now we've got these two behaviors on our player and we can close this, play the game and we should see some horizontal and vertical wrapping happening with our player entering and exiting the screen. Now we have a working game technically, but it's very ugly and let's go and make it a bit more pretty. So you can add images for this next part as well, but I'm going to show you a little bit of a different technique. So if you go to the background layer and let's uh, just unlock it, right click and then insert new object. This time, instead of a sprite, I'm going to add a tiled uh, background. So if we go on tile background, insert, here we go. So a tile background, all it does is it will replicate this cube. So I'm going to fill it in with some color again. This time I'm going to choose a ground like color, maybe very much darker ground like so. Then we can go ahead and maybe use the brush. You can change the size and select maybe a different color so we can see. Okay. So I'm actually going to select a darker brown and maybe instead of a brush, I'm going to choose this um, cube tool where I'll just be dragging out these little blocks. Now I see it has a border, so I want to eliminate that border by making it zero. And I'm changing my mind because this looks a bit ugly. So I'm going to try and um, make it a lighter sandy color. Uh, let's, let's find a bit of lighter sand. Maybe like that. That looks better. I'm going to go to a darker sand and then start maybe dragging some sand cubes. Now you can choose whatever style you want to do, of course. Um, this is just me trying to replicate some sand. I don't mind this being a little bit of a pixelated feeling. You can also import an image and use an image that you've designed in Photoshop. So you have many ways of doing this. Now I can close the sprite editor and there we go. We can also see that it's quite big. So let's go and change the ratio of this uh, tile background. Before we change the size, I'm going to go and rename this to just be sand. And now that we have that as sand, I'm going to select it, go down to where it says uh, X and Y scale. And I'm going to maybe change this to 10% for both. There we go. This is our sand texture. Now what makes a tile background very cool is that I can drag it in any direction and it will replicate itself. So let's go and fill basically this whole entire um, frame. So there we go. And now we got our beautiful sand texture. We can go ahead and lock the background layer again so that if we select our player or something, we don't select the background constantly. We can select play and there we go. We've got this nice sand texture and I feel like we need to add a water source. So I've gone ahead and made some assets for our game. Before we add some water, let's go ahead and open our player's graphic. 
Then I'm gonna go ahead and search for a file. I've made a file called ape, and as you can see, this ape is a top-down view and it's pointing to the right. This is crucial because having it point to the right means that it will be in the correct orientation. So now we have this. Something important to note is that there are some trigger areas when you're creating objects and images with a sprite. Now I call it trigger areas, but it's like the collision points. It basically tells the program where the shape lies of our sketchy ape. So you click on these triangles and then you can just define the shape. You can right click and have the program guess the polygon shape, but it's sometimes best to just do it manually. So I'm just gonna make a basic shape and that's good enough. We're gonna to need to define this if we want our player to interact with stuff in the world, maybe colliding with certain things like water. So let's go ahead and close this off. There's our player. And if we click play again, now we can see we've got our sketchy ape running around from a top-down view. Let's go and add some water. At this point, I can probably create a new layer, but I'm gonna keep it on the background layer. So I'm gonna unhide this, right click, insert a new object and search for Sprite. Now I can click anywhere and let me go and find the water image, which is this one, open it, make sure that it's trigger areas by selecting there is well defined. I can guess the shape and this is what it gives me, but I need to add a bit more definition. So I'm going to actually um, right click and add a point right click and um, add a point. So this way I get to clearly define my shape of the water. There we go. And we can do it a bit more in detail, but I guess this is good, good enough for this example. Maybe we can add one more in here. There we go. So now our water is defined and it knows the collision areas, but it's not solid yet. So if I click on exit, let me place it first. What I mean by not solid yet is if I play the game right now and I walk with my sketchy ape, I can walk all over this water. Now, technically that's fine. It means that the character probably is swimming, but in my case, I want it to stop here and maybe perform something like drinking water. So we need to make the water a solid object. Again, select your water, go to behaviors, and let's search for the solid behavior. There it is. Let's add it. When we click on play now and move around with our character, we can freely move, but if we wanna walk over this water, we can't. And it stops us because the water object is now solid. Let's go and add some logic to know when the character is close enough to this water source and have something happen. Maybe having an info bar popping up uh, telling us that we can drink the water. This is the part where we are going to see how to implement code, but before we do, we need some kind of info banner. On the layers panel, I'm gonna right click and insert a new layer and call this maybe info. And on here, I'm gonna right click, insert a new object again, I'm gonna simply choose a sprite and then load up the info bar that I want to show. This is how it's gonna look. This doesn't look clean at all, but it doesn't matter because none of our objects are gonna interact with this object. So I can just say that's fine. There it is. And I can zoom out a little bit so I can place it over here. I want this to show only when the character is over the water so that we can get some information. We can even make this a bit more smaller. So there it's in place. And I also just want to rename this as well as our water. So rename our water and info. There we go. Okay. So at this point we want our character to not show up initially. So if we select this, uh, we can play around with the opacity, maybe make that op opacity zero. But there's also this initial visibility, which we can take uh, to be false. So when we play the game, we won't see this info bar at all. 
but how do we show it up? Now, the way we're going to do that is to detect if this sketchy ape, our player, is close enough to the water. We can do this in two ways. We can either create another game object, make it invisible, and detect if the sketchy ape is close or touching that object, or we can simply reference this object and check the offsets to make sure that it's kind of close enough for us to show this, um, this character. But only when it touches it, we really want the character to drink from the water. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think it makes sense if we create an object um, overlapping this uh, water section. That way it would be very easy for us to know when we are overlapping the water. So what we can do is maybe put this on the background layer too. Right click, insert object, and this is going to be a sprite. We're going to click. And I actually want to make this a circle. So let's draw a circle here in the middle, like so. Let's give it um, its shape. So we're going to right click and guess. That's good enough. And I'm going to say exit and give this a name. I'm going to call this trigger and that's going to be fine. I'm going to overlay this over our water and for now just turn the opacity down to 50%. I really want to see the trigger area that uh, is going to cause this character to pop up. Later on we can just simply turn this to be invisible. Okay, so it's time for us to look at the logic of the game. Now remember our main event sheet? Well, if you double click on that, it will open the event sheet. Here we can add an event. Events work in a, a condition and action kind of way. Something, If something is a certain way, a condition is met, then an action will be applied. And it's as simple as that. It's basically telling a story. So our condition, our beginning of our story, will include our player. We're going to select our player or double click to get to the next stage. Or you can simply click on next. We're going to say, well, our player needs to do something. When something is happening, then we want another thing to happen. So what we want to happen in this case is we want to see if we scroll down to the collision area, we want to see if our character is overlapping another object. So select that and click on next. Then we need to select the object that we are busy overlapping. We're going to select our trigger. Click OK and click on done. So now we can see our first event is here. Our first event consists of a condition, which is if the player is overlapping the trigger, and an action, which is not there yet. So now we can add the action. So let's click on add action. And what do we need to happen? Well, it's simple. We need this info. So select info click on next, we need the info to be visible. So if you scroll down to appearance, there is set visible, say next, and then here we can just simply leave it on visible and click on done. Our first bit of logic is complete. We can move back to the main layout, so double click on that. And now if we play the game, we should be seeing this info character popping up if our character overlaps this yellow trigger area. So let's move around and, and you know, nothing is happening. But as soon as we enter this area, there's our character. And the character is saying, hey, I think I can drink this. So this is pretty cool. But the only part that's not cool is if we move out, the character still stays there. The info section still stays there and that's not useful. So. Let's go and add that logic where we take the character away. So going back to the main event sheet, we can do this in two different ways. We can simply say that, well, if we right click on this event, we can add a statement. Now adding an else statement is very similar in code where, well, if this condition is not met, what else should happen? Well, if the player is not overlapping there, for the duration of the game, then we're going to copy this visibility or you can add a new action and do the same thing. You can simply 
paste it as well and then click on the action and turn this invisible. What this is going to cause is saying, well, if the character is overlapping the trigger, set this to visible. Otherwise, always set it to invisible. Jumping back to the game, let's go and play it and check it out. So here we can see that if we overlapping this area, we can see this character info popping up, but as soon as we leave, it's gone. And it can come back as soon as we overlap this yellow trigger. Now, maybe we only want this to ever show up once and then as soon as it's visible, maybe it waits for a few seconds and then goes away forever. Let's try and implement that because it's quite annoying going in and out of this trigger and then seeing this character popping up. So we only want to see this uh, maybe once. So in code, there's a lot of ways to do solutions. So let's go and find a way on how we can show this up once and only once. We can go back to the main event sheet and let's play around with this logic. What if we show the object and then delete it from our scene? We can try that as well. And that means we can get rid of this else statement. We can then simply say that if it's overlapping the trigger, then do something. But maybe at this point, overlapping is not the best. Maybe we need to check if the player collided with this trigger instead of overlapping it. First things first, let's change this behavior. We're going to double click on it and we can actually backtrack and say, well, instead of overlapping, how about if we, uh, the collision is with another object? Select that, make sure the trigger is selected and click on done. Now this is if the player on collision with the trigger do something. The first thing I want to do is actually delete the trigger itself. So I can click on add action, trigger. And then if we scroll down or we can just search for destroy, we can select destroy. This will destroy this game item. Seeing if we don't need to use this again and I need to move this up, maybe I'll move this down. So what's going to happen is as soon as we collide with the trigger, the trigger is going to be destroyed, meaning that we can never collide really with this trigger again. We then need a way for the info section to go false again or destroy itself as well. You don't need to destroy game items if you're going to repurpose them throughout your game. But if this is something that's only going to show up once for a user and never again, you might as well get rid of it. But we don't want to get rid of it right away. So uh, when it comes to actions, they all run in a chronological order. So the destroying of the trigger will happen first, then the info will be set to visible. And then I want to wait before something else. So in the actions, I can add an action, this time going into system and typing in wait. I want to wait for a few seconds. So selecting the wait, I'm going to say wait about, I don't know, maybe five seconds. Maybe that's too long, maybe four seconds. And then only do something. After four seconds, let's go ahead and destroy this uh, object as well. So now let's go back and play the game. When we click on play, we can now see that our info section is not there. What we expect to happen is that if we indeed collide with this trigger, we should see the trigger going away, being destroyed, as well as our info section popping up. Let's go and check it out. And there we go. The trigger section is away and four seconds, then this one is gone as well. Beautiful. We have received the info and I think we can extend that time and then maybe turn this trigger area invisible uh, on the initial load. What I am going to do now is actually move this aside, click on our water and then remove this solid behavior. I really don't actually want the water to be solid because I want the ape to actually go into the water at a later stage and then drink from it. I'm then going to move the trigger back, but this time increasing the size before I put it invisible because I want the ape to actually notice this um, piece of water and, you know, before they before he actually goes in. 
uh, and drinks from it. So maybe this is a good size. And then we can also go ahead and set the initial visibility to false. I'm going to move my character a bit over to the left hand side so that it doesn't immediately collide with this. And then, like we said, we're going to increase the wait seconds to five. That's fine. And now we can go back. So our game at this point is a good starter, but there's no game really, right? There's just stuff happening. So we need to gamify this. So let's make some kind of life bar. And if the life bar runs out, then the ape dies. Um, and in order to stay alive, we need to go and drink water. But we also need some other motivation for not staying in the water. So let's go and check out what we can do. In our info layer, let's go ahead and add a progress bar. So let's go and insert a progress bar like so. Insert. And let's place it here at the top. We can design our own progress bar and we can also use CSS to style it. But for now, it's just going to be basic. On the value over here, we want to turn the value, the initial value to 100. Now, if we play the game, um, we can just click, click on play there. We can see that it is full. Now let's devise some kind of logic where every second we get to uh, deduct from our life bar, so to speak. Firstly, let's go and rename our progress bar. I've got two. Um, I'm going to remove one. I'm going to keep the one that's on the screen and let's rename it to life bar. And now what we need to do is in our event sheet, we need to deduct. So we will need some kind of value to deduct from. So we can simply right click instead of adding a event, you right click and say add global variable. This time I'm going to call this variable life. It's going to be of type number and the initial value is going to be a hundred. So this is not constant. We can click OK. Your global variables will all, you know, pop up here on the top. And we need to link this to our progress bar. Even though we set our progress bars value here to 100, we really need it to be uh, linking all the time and updating from our variable. So in order to sync up our global variable with our life bar, we can add an event, which is a systems event. And we're going to type in every because I want to use every tick might be a bit overkill, we can do every second, but Every tick will be fine. Every tick means every frame that gets rendered. So every tick, we want to basically check and set the progress of our life bar. So we're going to say next. Search for progress. So here's the progress. Say next. We want to set this to a value. So we can now simply search for our uh, life. There we go. And we can just select that. We can simply set that equal uh, to our life. And then we know that on every tick of this game, the life bar is going to be synced up with this global variable. So going now in our logic, we can simply just change this var variable and the value and we should see it reflect. Next, nothing is going to change. So we need to actually add a new event, again, a systems event. And this time we're going to use every X seconds. So we're going to say next and we want to do it on every second. And what needs to happen? Well, we would like to deduct from our global variable. So let's say subtract from. And here is life. We're going to subtract maybe one to make it more clear. Let's subtract two. click on done. And if we play the game now, we should see our life bar starting to deduct and it's stressful because we need to do something otherwise we're going to run out of life so let's think about this for a second if the character is not overlapping the water meaning the character is not drinking water so we're losing life if the character is overlapping the water then we should be gaining life so what we can do is repurpose this event and um, now we're going to get into sub event so right click on this event because on every on every second we want something to happen. So let's create a sub event. And we're going to say on every second and as a sub event, if our player, uh, let's search for overlap. 
is overlapping the water. You can say done. Do something. So now let's move this in here in our, into our sub event. But remember, if we are overlapping our water, we want to gain life. So I'm going to duplicate this sub event and just make sure to right click on this one to invert it. When you invert something, it's basically saying that if it's not overlapping the water. So then we can subtract. But here we should be adding. So we're going to go one back and change this into an add. There we go. So on every second, basically, if we are drinking water, we're going to add to. Um, on every second, if we're going to not overlap the water, we should subtract the life. We will also need to add some kind of clamping method because we can't have the life go over a hundred. Going under a hundred sub zero is fine because our character will be dead, but certainly not over a hundred. Otherwise the progress will be way too much. In order to clamp and make sure we don't go overboard, we can add a new condition um, in here. And then let's check for a variable comparison. So that one. We need to check if life is at least less or equal to. And because we're incrementing in 2, we need to be less or equal to 98. So at least it does it one more time. And that should be fine. That should prevent us from going over 100. And let's see how this works. Let's click on play. And now we're in our game. We can see our life is draining and we don't know what is going on. So as soon as we get close to the water, oh, I think I can drink this. Wow. <laughs> and we go into the water. And as long as we're in the water, you can see our life um, going up again. And that is great. So let's wait for it to fill up so we can just test uh, as soon as we jump out. And we go out. So now the problem is we don't know if our variable ever went over 100 because we can't see. So how do you debug in Construct 3? Well, let me show you. So the only thing you'll need to do when you want to debug is instead of clicking on play, click on this drop down arrow and then click on debug layout. What this will do is play the game, but you'll also get this extra kind of um, stats on your game. Now you can explore this. You can see the life bar where it's at. But also what's cool is if you click on the system, and you go down, there should be a section for global variables. And there we have it. So you can watch this. And if we go into the water, you can make, keep track and make sure that this variable indeed does not go over a hundred. So we are staying in the water and the variable stays at a hundred. That is beautiful. And when we leave, it goes down. When we go in, it goes up. And that's how you debug the application and your game. Now, of course, there's a lot we can do. This is very simple, but I wanted to introduce you into the world of Construct 3 and what's possible with this HTML game engine. In order to export your game, depending if you are a paying subscriber or not, you'll have more options. You can click on menu, then simply go to project, export, and here you get different platforms. So Android, iOS, and a whole bunch of others. You can export this as an HTML5 game and guess what? Even make it an NFT. Well, if you guys want to see me doing that sort of stuff and also completing this game to make it more fun and actually implement some heavy game logic, let me know in the comments. Also, if you like this content, subscribe, like, and give me a comment below, letting me know all sorts of stuff. I really appreciate you guys out there. Thank you so much and have an amazing day. Cheers for now.